다음 강의는 ICHM7 브록을 주제로 아스트라제니카의 페트리샤 페리스님의 아, 페리스님의 강의가 있겠습니다. 큰 박수로 페트리샤 페리스님을 모시도록 하겠습니다. Please welcome Ms. Patricia Paris with a round of applause. Thanks very much. Um, and I'd just like to th thank the organizers for inviting me today. Um, I've got a really flying visit, and I actually fly back tomorrow. I leave at 11. So um, if you do catch me later on, happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, my email is at the end of the presentation. And I appreciate that this is a very detailed topic on calculating acceptable limits. And you may, uh, you know, you may have a question later on when you're trying to do that rather than remember this now. So feel free to contact me uh, whenever, you, whenever you like. Um, likewise, um, as Richard, I'm actually a project toxicologist at AstraZeneca, um, so I do that for, for the majority of my job, but my other kind of passion really is around impurity management and control, and I, it might sound really weird, but I just really enjoy uh, working and, and doing stuff on impurities. I get very enthusiastic about it. I will try and talk slowly, um, but if my enthusiasm takes over, I shall be keeping an eye out for a wave to slow down. <laughs> okay. So, you know, as we've heard of, um, the previous speaker gave an excellent talk summarizing the M7 guidance. Um, and, you know, impurities in pharmaceuticals come from all different types of sources. You've got starting materials from the packaging they can leach in, intermediates, degradation products over time, um, some metal catalysts are used in the synthetic process, and also residual solvents. Um, these impurities are always going to be there. We're always going to have to manage this. Um, they're there at low levels, but the key thing we want to ask as toxicologists is, is there a safety concern? And obviously, mutagenic carcinogens are probably one of the highest risk uh, types of chemicals that we want to look at. Um, actually, AstraZeneca and GSK, um, a couple of years ago, actually did a review of publicly available synthetic pharmaceutical synthetic routes. There was about 300, just over 300 routes that they looked at. And only one of those routes was actually able to... Um, not use any mutagenic carcinogens or not even have any mutagenic impurities in there. So whilst we might like to kind of avoid all use of such chemicals in our synthetic processes, it actually in practi practically isn't possible. So we really need to manage and control mutagenic impurities and that was really the basis behind developing the M7 guidance document. Um, but it's appreciated that uh, Calculating um, PDEs and, ex and exposure limits is um, quite a subjective process. Um, there's lots of stages where the toxicologist needs to review the information and um, you know, really pu put their expert judgment on the analysis and what we use. So that is why the M7 addendum was, was developed. And really the focus of the addendum is around uh, these class one, class one uh, known mutagenic carcinogens. So these are chemicals that we know are AIMS positive um, and that's what defines it as a mutagen. Um, and we also have carcinogenicity data to be able to define it as a carcinogen. And it's reviewing and looking at this carcinogenicity data that's important when we're calculating these exposure limits. So that's what I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on today. So once you have your synthetic route, You've identified any potential um, impurities and also known impurities that you have in there. The, step, the, the first step in the process is the hazard identification. So looking and gathering what information we have out there on our mutagenic, uh, mutagenic carcinogens. So looking at exposure to the general population is important. So do we have any information in food, water, air? Um, clearly, we're going to be looking at our genotox uh, results. So They're going to be AIMS positive, but also having a look at the in vitro and in vivo gene tox results is, is also helpful in informing the, the mode of action for tumor induction. Carcinogenicity obviously plays a major part in the um, review of information. And also it's worthwhile looking out there to see if there's actually any uh, regulatory published limits. So, um, you know, all the regulatory agencies in the US and in Europe and across the world, they do publish limits for food, for drinking water, and those can be really helpful reference limits that you can use. Either you might be able to use the limit itself, or you can use it to benchmark um, your exposure limits um, against and to compare it to. Sometimes also non-carcinogenic endpoints are useful um, to review, uh, review as well. So this will be your acute studies, any repeat dose data, the reproductive or neurotoxicity and developmental studies. Um, and sometimes these can be helpful in trying to understand any pre-carcinogenic events, looking particularly at things like irritation and inflammation or even uh, methemoglobinemia. 
So for the class ones, um, where are you going to find your carcinogenicity data? So this is the link to the carcinogenicity potency database. Um, it's available in the addendum, but it's also here for your reference as well. Um, this is really a key source for getting the carcinogenicity studies. But I would also highly recommend just doing a literature search as well for other carcinogenicity studies that are out there. Um, you know, some health authorities do the testing, require testing, and I mean, I've found data um, uh, that the Japan health authorities have done on carcinogenicity studies that isn't in this database. So it's a key resource, but it's also worth looking at what else is out there. The carcinogenicity data, if it's robust, that should be used to calculate a compound-specific limit. Um, a TTC should not be used if you have data that's good enough to calculate um, an exposure limit. Um, the TTC, the threshold of toxicological concern, is very conservative. It should be very conservative, um, and it is. And what you actually often find is by using compound-specific data, it results in a higher limit. Um, and this can be very helpful for your pharmaceutical um, development colleagues in their control of these impurities. So it is often worthwhile um, calculating these compound-specific limits. Um, and I would also recommend, um, you know, having a very strong relationship with your pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical manufacturing colleagues. Um, the M7 is a multidisciplinary guidance, and the reason it is is because it's, it's a very close collaboration between the pharmaceutical manufacturing colleagues um, and the safety and toxicology colleagues. It's important to work together um, and really use each other's expertise in uh, management and control of these mutagenic impurities. So the addendum um, is, is a really useful document. Um, you know, I, I was involved in um, kind of some of the monographs, um, actually the hydrogen peroxide one, and you know, we spent so much time discussing the compounds that we wanted to um, include in there as examples of how to calculate compound-specific acceptable intakes or the permissible daily exposures. The addendum includes mutagens and carcinogens, and it includes 14 chemicals that are common to the pharmaceutical manufacturing process. And really, it illustrates the principles for deriving compound-specific limits. You've got examples for both um, acceptable intakes and uh, PDEs. And it's all there, all the de detail and information is stored there in the monographs um, for you to review and, and look at and, and just get some experience in how to calculate these limits. It's important to emphasize that these exposure limits are very much uh, based on carcinogenic risk. Um, so that really is the focus. Uh, sometimes other tox considerations need to be looked at. So you need to look at the whole data, data package together. And um, your final specifications may be driven by other quality standards. So um, Jimmy pre presented the control and batch testing information that M7 um, lays out. So if you have an impurity um, exposure limit that's in the milligrams per day range, but your batch testing is show that that impurity is present at micrograms per day, then you're not going to be able to set your limit at that milligrams per day. You know, it should be driven by both your um, batch, batch testing data on the impurity as well as your um, exposure limit. So that really that quality and safety um, in combination. And I've just picked out four examples here where you've got some um, linear extrapolated uh, exposure limits as well as um, some adjustment factor PDE type exposure limits. And I'll talk through these in more detail as we go through the presentation. So acceptable limits can be calculated in different ways. And it's very much dependent on the carcinogenicity data that's available um, and what that data is telling you about the chemical and its dose response. Acceptable intakes. Um, that calculation is preferred for carcinogens that have a linear dose response, and the permissible daily exposure calculation is for those that have a non-linear non dose response. So there's a threshold, threshold there. Um, and as Yumi uh, mentioned, and I'll say again, the Q3C and Q3D guidance, ICH guidances for solvents and elemental impurities, um, have a lot of uh, additional information on calculating PDs and the adjustment factors that should be used. So let's go a bit more into detail about um, the process. So you've done your literature review, you've done that step one. The next step is you have your carcinogenicity data available. You need to, and there isn't, there isn't an easy way around this. You, you have to become carcinogenicity study experts. You need to look at that data, go into the detail of the study and try and understand the robustness of the study and, it's, and, and if it's you know, suitable to be used for calculating exposure limits. So the quality of the studies in the carcinogenicity potency database is variable. They have some criteria 
um, dependent on the dur duration of uh, dosing across a lifetime in the animal, but that's really the only criteria they use to include or exclude the data. So um, the addendum recommends an additional level of critique of the study, and that it lists out these reasons why a carcinogenesis study is not considered robust. So this would be if you have less than 50 animals per dose uh, per sex, or less than three dose levels, if there's a lack of concurrent controls, um, and intermittent dosing, this can, um, depending on the duration of dosing, and if it's for less than a lifetime, it may not be suitable to use for um, calculating an exposure limit. There are some exceptions. Um, if you have um, intermittent dosing, uh, then but you have demonstrated some toxicity or you're at a maximum tolerated dose, then uh, you, can, you, you see that you wouldn't need to dose for any longer, so that's a good justification that that study can be used. Um, if you are using a study that has intermittent dosing, then you should adjust your um, dosing exposure to a daily dose per week. Another, um, in the absence of any more data, you might be able to use the carcinogenicity study. It just very much depends on what the whole package of information you have on that chemical is. is so, um, but for all these, all these exceptions, it's important, and uh, all of the speakers to this today, it's important to clearly document your scientific rationale of why you're choosing that study and why it's acceptable. So looking a bit more at the study and this cancer potency value, so we've talked about the TD50, what is it? Well, the car carcinogenicity potency database have derived this numerical description of carcinogenic potency and it's termed the TD50. So it's a dose that results in a 50% increase in tumours over the background level. It's a standardised measure that allows us to compare um, and analyse carcinogenicity studies. And there's a huge range of TD50 values um, across the rodent carcinogens in the database, and it's uh, like more than a million-fold differences in potency. So it's an important value, um, and it's critical in deriving our compound-specific limits. So once you have your um, study, we know it's robust. The next um, section is what TD50, because sometimes you're very lucky, and you might have multiple carcinogenicity study, so which one do you select to use for deriving your, your exposure limit? If there are multiple studies, the carcinogenicity potency database um, actually does calculate a harmonic mean TD50, but this is not deemed sensitive enough to actually calculate an acceptable limit for impurities. So you should be looking at the studies and taking your lowest TD50 from a particular organ site for an animal species and sex, and that should be selected from your most robust carcinogenicity study. The CBDB do also have this group uh, called TBA. It's called all tumour-bearing animals. They just group everything together in one big lump. Um, and that also is not considered sensitive enough to use that TD50 value to calculate your exposure limit. But if they've broken it out into uh, particular tumour types for an organ, so you might have adenomas and carcinomas in the liver, for example, then that is very sensitive and that can be used. So, as I said, there isn't an easy way to do this. You have to look at your study in a lot of detail and analyse it thoroughly uh, to work out what is the best point of departure to use for your exposure limit. So we've talked about looking at the studies, which study to select, which um, cancer potency value to select. Now let's have a look in a bit more detail about the methods. And Yumi did touch on this in her presentation, but again, um, it, you've had a lot of information today and it probably isn't going to hurt to just kind of go over the calculations again. So for mutagenic carcinogens, it's assumed that these chemicals have a linear dose response, and so you calculate your exposure limit using the acceptable intake uh, calculation. This is similar to the method that was used to derive the threshold of toxicological concern, and you, linearly lin you take a linear extrapolation from your cancer potency data, so from your TD50 that you've identified, that lowest TD50 in the most sensitive organ, species, and sex, and you extrapolate that down to a 1 in 100,000 risk. And this is deemed to be a virtually safe dose for, for cancer potency, for cancer risk in pharmaceutical products. It assumes there's a linear dose response curve, and so you take your TD50 and divide it by 50,000 to give you the dose in micrograms per kilogram per day. And then to give you your um, acceptable intakes in milligrams a day, you multiply this by a conservative human weight of 50 kilograms.
So this, uh, the 50 kilograms is lower than the usual 60 or 70 that is used in these types of calculations. Um, and that is a reason for that because impurities offer no benefit to the patient. You know, they're not going to get any, any benefit of those impurities being there. So we, we should be minimizing these as much as possible. And so we add in these extra levels of conservatism to the calculation. So I've just picked out an example hydrazine um, from the addendum to look at. So hydrazine is a very reactive uh, starting material and reagent used in, in numerous um, synthetic pharmaceutical synthetic processes. Um, humans can be exposed to hydrazine in the environment by contamination in water and air and soil, um, and uh, also in the workplace, and it's in some uh, uh, tobacco products as well. Obviously, hydrazine is, is a mutagenic because it's, it's in the, the addendum, it's a mutagenic, and it's also positive in some other genetic tox assays like the mouse lymphoma and some in vivo assays, um, the micronuclei, and it's been shown to, cause, uh, to form DNA adducts as well. It's classified by IARC as a, uh, as a class 2B carcinogen, so it's possibly uh, carcinogenic to humans. And this is, um, it's also positive in five out of seven carcinogenicity studies that are available in the, the carcinogenicity potency database. So there are oral and inhalation carcinogenicity studies available, um, and orally, the target organs are the liver and the lungs. Uh, and in the inhalation studies, the target organs are the nasal cavity and the lung, so very much site of contact carcinogenesis by the inhalation route for hydrazine. So as humans are exposed to hydrazine um, in water, air and oil, there are US um, environmental protection agency limits out there for hydrazine. So there's a drinking water level and an air level. And these are calculated based on a one in a million carcinogenic risk. So looking at the calculations, so because we uh, have a, a much lower carcinogenicity potency value, so a much lower TD50 for the inhalation study versus the oral, um, it was deemed appropriate to actually calculate two, um, two acceptable intakes, one for the oral route and one for the inhalation route. So looking at the oral studies, there are four mouse studies and two rat studies. The most sensitive effect was based on hepatocellular adenomas and carcinomas in the liver of female rats. So this gave us a TD50 of 38.7. So by applying the linear extrapolation calculation, this gives you an, uh, a lifetime oral acceptable intake of 39 micrograms per day. Looking at the inhalation studies, as I said, it was a site of contact carcinogen. Um, so the most sensitive tissue were the nasal, nasal regions of the male rats in a one-year study. So it's not the standard design, it's only one year, but because we saw a positive result, it's quite clear that we haven't missed that window for uh, tumor formation, so we, it's appropriate to use the study. The TD50 there is adjusted to account for the one versus two year exposure, and then linear, linearly extrapolating, this gives us a lifetime inhalation acceptable intake of 0.2 micrograms per day. So you can see with hydrazine is a good example where route of administration is an important consideration when calculating these acceptable limits. Um, if you select the lowest TD50, uh, for, so if you say you have a number of carcinogenicity studies by different routes, um, if, you, if you don't have any route specific uh, tumors, um, you can just take the lowest TD50 and use that to derive an exposure limit that should be acceptable for all different routes of administration. But when you're looking at the studies, if you notice things like local toxicity, for example, irritation, or site-specific tumors, so this could be in the nasal cavity following inhalation or in the fore stomach following oral administration, and there are no other distal tumors, um, you need to take that into consideration, and the best situation there is to calculate a route-specific exposure limit. And hydrazine and dimethyl carbamyl chloride are two good examples of that in the addendum. Just looking at this in a bit more detail, as I said, for some volatile chemicals like solvents, you may actually only have an inhalation study, of carcinogenicity study available. So what do you do if you have an inhalation carcinogenicity study on an impurity in an oral pharmaceutical? Well, the bioavailability from an inhalation, um, from a compound going through in inhalation is going to be different to oral um, because you don't have the first pass metabolism. It's likely to be a lot higher exposure systemically than an oral, orally administered uh, chemical. 
So you could take a worst case scenario and assume that the bioavailability is 100%, it's, it's equivalent across the routes, and use that inhalation study to calculate your, your oral exposure limit. Um, it probably will result in a very low ex uh, exposure limit, uh, but at least you're being conservative. Another option is if you have some oral bioavailability data, you can use this in the calculation to take that into consideration. If you have uh, local effects, as I said, you need to be uh, considering this and calculating a route-specific PDE or, or, or um, acceptable intake. Uh, poorly soluble particles can be uh, a, a problem from the inhalation route, uh, but it may not be relevant to the oral route. So you need to look at the, the toxicities that you're seeing, the tumours and the location of the tumours you're seeing and try and determine uh, if it's applicable to the particular route of administration that you're interested in. Another way of uh, using additional kind of exposure data to help and aid your exposure calculations is looking at toxicodynamic and toxicokinetic effects. So you might have a species sensitivity effect. So rodents are very sensitive to inhalation exposure. Um, this might not be relevant uh, for the human situation. And so you can actually use toxicodynamic and toxicokinetic data in your exposure limit calculation to account for that species, um, species sensitivity. It's been mentioned a couple of times by the speakers today, human relevance is very important when we're uh, critically analysing our, our non-clinical data. And it's just as important for pharmaceutical impurity, safety assessment, as it is for your clinical development of your pharmaceutical product. So impurities will be in there at low non-toxic concentrations. So some of the tumours that you see in your, your rodent studies aren't relevant to humans, and we need to take that into consideration in our review and our assessment. So an example of this would be uh, methyl chloride. There's a species difference um, in metabolism, um, and this, this won't occur at low non-toxic concentrations, so you need to be looking out for metabolism differences. Um, another example, is, uh, which is included in the addendum, is for parachloroaniline, where the most sensitive site for tumor induction was actually in the spleen. But the tu these tumours are associated with hemosiderosis, um, which is a non-linear mechanism of action, and it's not relevant to humans at these low doses, because uh, you're not going to see that hemosiderosis. There's no point using that. Um, it will give you a very low exposure level that isn't relevant for humans. So looking at the chloroaniline carcinogicity data, actually liver tumours um, were used for the linear extrapolation of the acceptable intake. The TD50 for these liver tumours was higher than that for um, the, sp the splenic tumours, but it was a more relevant endpoint to use for human risk assessment. Um, and as the linear mechanism of action couldn't be ruled out for those uh, liver tumours, then an acceptable intake method was used to calculate uh, the exposure limit. So we spent a lot of time talking about um, the linear dose response. If a threshold has been uh, defined, so this is where you're able to say there's a dose below which you're not going to see any effect, then um, you can calculate your exposure limit using a different methodology that takes into consideration adjustment factors. So I'm just going to talk through the ICHQ3C calculation um, and give an example of that as well. So, as I've mentioned, a non-linear mechanism of action actually uh, for tumour induction doesn't have relevance for, for humans at these low doses. And, and the reason we can say that is because we know that some chemicals are rapidly detoxified when they get in the body. So, with regarding mutagenicity, super reactive chemicals probably have reacted before they even get a chance to get into the cell and get near the DNA. So that is one reason why you can see these threshold um, non-linear dose responses for mutagenic carcinogens. The body is actually also very effective at repairing DNA. We are taking in and being bombarded with carcinogens and mutagens all the time. Um, so it does have very effective DNA repair mechanisms, and it is only when these become overwhelmed that you see uh, mutagenic responses. So this is also a reason why you can have a non-linear non response for mutagenic carcinogens. So if you have looked, reviewed your data and you've come up with a good scientific rationale of why your mechanism is non-linear, then you can use the permissible daily exposure method that's outlined in the Q3C and Q3D guidance. And you apply adjustment factors to a point of departure to derive your exposure limits. 
These are some specific examples of non-linear non mechanisms of action. These are listed in the addendum, and I think they're really useful to be aware of so that when you're looking at your carcinogenicity study, you can be you can be thinking, oh yes, we're seeing you know splenic tumours. Do we have hemisiderin deposits? It's a non-linear mechanism of action, so I know which uh, method of exposure limit to, to calculate. And aniline and the related um, compounds are a good example of that, where you see this methemoglobinemia. Um, if mutagenicity isn't essential to the mode of action, so you might have weak, weak signals in your AIMS test, um, and you've looked at the in vivo gene tox data, and there's no correlation between uh, your in vivo gene tox response and the organs where you see tumor induction. That might also suggest that it could, it could be a non-mutagenic mechanism. If you have tumors, the site of contact tumors that are associated with irritation or inflammation, as this would be your example of your rodent four stomach tumors, um, or um, site of contact carcinogens, and benzyl chloride is a good example of that. These are also likely to be causing tumors by a nonlinear mode of action. Um, oxidative damage is also a threshold response, um, and hydrogen peroxide is an example of, of a chemical that has this, and was uh, an exposure limit was calculated using the PDE methodology. And there are even examples of DNA reactive chemicals for which a threshold has been proposed, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the Viricept uh, contamination example with ethyl methane sulfonate, so EMS. EMS. Um, and Roche did a huge amount of work in vivo and in vitro demonstrating that the mutagenicity has a threshold response and you can identify a point of departure to use in a PD type calculation. It's a, it's a lot of work and I don't think there'll be many more examples of this, but this is one where we have a clear demonstration of a DNA reactive chemical that has a threshold response. So this is the Q3C um, calculation for a PDE. So you have your point of departure, you multiply this by your conservative human body weight of 50 grams, and then you divide this by your adjustment factors that are along the bottom. And I'm gonna go through each of the adjustment factors um, in turn. We do add in, um, in the brackets at the end, this F6, which is a uh, adjustment factor that the toxicologist can use at their discretion if you have, for example, bioavailability differences that you want to take into consideration, or you might want to take, uh, add something else for the robustness of, of your data. If you have selected a carcinogenicity study that you know uh, is, has some limitations, um, but you want to use it, it's scientifically justified to use it, then you may want to add an additional safety factor to account for that uncertainty. But the process is very similar. Um, you will do a literature review of all of the data. Um, and I think with these nonlinear dose response chemicals, it's important, really important to look at the non-carcinogenic endpoints as well and have a real good overall picture of the mechanism of action and the, the, the toxicity of these, these types of chemicals. You identify the critical effect. It could be, uh, and hopefully it's a no adverse um, effects level or in the case there isn't one, a lowest effect level, and use that as your point of departure. So the different adjustment factors. F1 um, accounts for extrapolation between species. F2 um, looks at the variability between um, individuals, so that, that intra-variability. F3 um, is there to account, to account for the duration of the study that you're, that you're um, using for your exposure limit calculation. F4 is an additional factor you can include if you have a severe toxicity. F5 is driven around whether you've got your no observed effect level established. And as I said, you have an additional F6 there as well. So the ICHQ3C guidance gives you the actual numerical adjustment factors to apply for your um, species uh, translation, and it's based on a comparative surface area to body weight ratio for your species uh, to man. So these can all be found in the ICHQ3C uh, document. F2 is typically defaulted to 10. Just to explain the picture, um, I presented at a, a PDE workshop last year, um, and we found out the, the presenters, we all really like marvel, and so there was this kind of theme going through, so I just put that in there to kind of lighten up the presentation. <laughs> Appreciate it's not the most exciting of topics. So F3 is there for, to account for the um, duration of the toxicity study. So you know a higher factor will account for a shorter duration study that you're using. 
F4 looks at the severity. So this would be if you're looking at a non-genotoxic carcinogen, you might have neurotoxicity or teratogenicity. It, it can be an overused factor because we look at the hazards to actually define what we use for this adjustment factor. You know, if you've got a clear dose response and you've got a no, no observed adverse effect level defined, then you can have F1 as, as you can add, add F4 as a factor of one, and that's okay to do, that's scientifically justified. So, you know, really look at the data that you've got, and you don't need to just keep applying safety factors just because if, you, if you've got a clear rationale, then it can be one, it can be as low as that, and that's okay. Um, and Q3C also includes some guidance there, some numerical values if you have teratogenicity as your, your endpoint of concern. So if you haven't defined a no observed effect level in the carcinogenicity study, then you're, you're using a low effect level, then you probably want to add an additional factor for this. And as I said, you've got F6 that's there as your uh, toxicologist discretion if needs be. There are some other considerations. You know, the, the default factors are a guide. We should be using our brains, we should be using our scientific um, you know, integrity data review to decide what value you want to use as your adjustment factor. They're not a checkbox. Um, you need to develop a rationale for each adjustment factor and you need to document it so it's clear why you've, why you've chosen the value you have. It's important. Um, it's important uh, if things change over time, you might find some additional data that changes your risk assessment. And so by documenting it, you can remember, remind yourself what you did at that time based on the information, and it allows you to come back and, and change it if necessary as, as you're moving through development. The adjustment factor, as I said, can be changed. And there's, it, this, I think this is happening more and more of using um, you know, better, more relevant data to, to, to adjust your um, particularly the exposure, uh, the F1 and F2 kind of values that are very much kind of default values. If you have pharmaco-based, you know, pharmacokinetic modeling, it, this might allow you to reduce those adjustment factors. And, and every time you do that, you're, you're using more relevant data. So it's important to consider that and use extra data if you have it. There are some other methods, such as benchmark dose. This can be used instead of your F4. So if instead of um, an identified lowest effect level or lowest observed, observed effect level extrapolation. Um, and it's also worthwhile once you've calculated your composite adjustment factor to actually look at that value. Um, it's good to limit this to around 5,000. If you're going anywhere above that, it's suggesting that the data that you're using is just too uncertain and it's just very unrealistic and you're probably better than defaulting to some of the um, threshold of toxicological concern limits. So just looking at a quick example, this example, triphenylphosphine, TPP, is actually taken from a recent publication that came out last year um, from, by Joel Berku et al. So the human exposure data for TPP is limited. There's not a lot out there. It's actually a non-mutagenic uh, impurity. And we're looking here at the non-carcinogenic effects. So it appears to be neurotoxic. Dogs were the most sensitive species. So there was a lowest effect dose, one mix per kick per day, in a five-week dog study where some neurotoxicity was seen. However, that finding was actually of questionable relevance. It was only one dog per sex per group that saw the effect. Um, it occurred spontaneously, and it actually wasn't, we weren't able to, the, the, the data wasn't able to be, that finding wasn't able to be reproduced when a longer duration, three month uh, study was, was conducted in dogs with, and it was a more robust study because there were five dogs per group. And it's not been tested um, in a carcinogenicity study. So looking at the adjustment factors that was applied here, so because it's dog to man extrapolation, a uh, factor of two was given for F1. The standard tenfold was applied to F2. It's a very short duration study, five weeks only, so we um, applied a factor of 10 there. Although um, we're looking at potentially neurotoxicity, because the f that, that um, finding wasn't observed in a longer duration study, we've actually dialed down the severe toxicity here to one. Um, and there was the no observed effect level wasn't established, but again, we're questioning the relevance of that finding. We're using that data, but um, it was deemed appropriate to have one here as the, um, the safety factor. And 
putting this all into the calculation gives you an acceptable intake, a PDE of 250 micrograms per day. So as I mentioned, this was the Berku at our paper that came out at the uh, beginning of last year. When we were dis uh, discussing and deciding on the chemicals to include in the MCF M7 addendum, there were a number of a kind of rejects, as we affectionately called them, when we really wanted to make sure we you know, captured all the discussions that we had on reviewing and analysing the data for those chemicals. So we were very keen to make sure that got published and worked on, um, worked on this publication. And this has an additional 20 synthetic reagents and byproducts. Um, and so there's acceptable intakes and a lot of um, PDEs that we've published here, and also um, actually a limit for, uh, a class limit for monofunctional alcohol bromides. The paper includes a lot more non-mutagenic carcinogens and non-carcinogens, also some chemicals that were wrongly being classified as carcinogens that we, you know, when discussing within our companies, we realized we were getting the same feedback from, from um, some health authorities on the, class or the wrong classification of certain chemicals. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I think it's a really, it's a really good resource um, to, to check out because you might find your impurities in there and you don't need to go through the efforts of calculating an exposure limit. There are also a number of other sources for published um, PDE values out there. So there are 29 PDEs in the ICHQ3C and 24 elemental PDEs in ICHQ3D. So, you know, really look at and use these resources that are out there because it will save a lot of time and effort in, in you know, if there's a PDE already, already established. So some of the other considerations. Um, as I said, benchmark dose modeling is, is gaining more traction. It's used by the Environmental uh, Protection Agency in the US, and so it's an, it's an option to use the benchmark dose as a point of departure in your calculations. Be mindful of existing values that are out there, um, you know, published by the regulatory authorities. You might actually be able to use that value if you just adjust the carcinogenic risk. Um, so these regulatory values are usually derived based on the one in a million carcinogenic risk. So um, if you can extrapolate that to a one in a hundred thousand um, risk, you might be able to use that value. But it also gives you kind of a benchmark to your exposure limit value as well to see where you sit. Um, Another thing that, that we use when we're trying to understand um, our exposure levels is endogenous exposure versus your impurity exposure. So formaldehyde is a good example of this. It's produced in the body at milligram quantities, just as we're all sitting here. If you're comparing that to um, you know, patient exposure to microgram levels of impurity, then the, expo you know, the risk from that impurity exposure is extremely low. And so that's really useful information to build into your impurity risk assessment. You can read across for compounds um, if you have a lack of data or even a whole class. Um, you know, if you can calculate a class limit, then that's, that's really great um, and, you know, can, can really help accessing kind of exposure limits across, across the class. And higher levels can also be justified. So, you know, Yumi talks about this. Think about your less than lifetime treatments. Think about your patient population if it's an oncology indication with, um, you know, life-threatening you know, the patients may only be living for five years, then um, you don't need to consider a lifetime exposure limit. So there's options to have, have higher limits. The table at the top here is just the, uh, the less than lifetime limits from, from the guidance. Um, you know, it can, it's a conservative approach controlling uh, mutagenic carcinogens to the TTC, and sometimes it is challenging. Um, you'll talk to your pharmaceutical manufacturing colleagues, it is challenging to control it to those low levels. So, you know, we need to have different tools and different ways of looking at the information to be able to, to actually sometimes progress forward and, you know, move on with our, our synth manufacturing synthetic routes. So you, you might not be able to control to the TTC, so you need to think about some of these other things. Um, for non-carcinogens, uh, it's not 100% relevant to the presentation, but I wanted to include, include these um, reference limits here. There are some other systems that you can use that have uh, already defined exposure limits, depending on like the structure uh, that you can use. So you've got the Kramer, Monroe, and the Dolan um, classifications. They can be helpful for, for non-mutagenic uh, carcinogens, or non-carcinogens at least. You know, so we do recognise, it is recognised across, across industry that it's a, it is a subjective process. 
you know, selecting your study, selecting your can cancer potency data, um, and then deriving these exposure limits. So there was actually this meeting that I alluded to earlier was organized by the Gene Tox Association last year. So LASA um, actually hosted a workshop where we were discussing deriving compound specific limits. Um, we had quite a snazzy tool, it was an app called Poll Everywhere, so we were able to actually present case studies and have questions and audience and get them to vote on what adjustment factors they would apply for particular situations. And it was amazing to see the difference and the variety of answers. So, you know, it is very subjective depending on people's levels of, you know, risk and conservatism and what you would do. So it was a really useful workshop and we are very close to publishing um, a paper just some, with some recommendations from the outcome of that workshop. So please look out for that. Um, I'm also part of the Extractables and Leachables Safety Information Exchange. So the focus here is really obviously around extractable and leachable chemicals. And we are also about to, pub uh, about to submit for publishing um, a paper that's got an additional five permissible daily exposures that are more focused around common extractable and leachable chemicals. So, you know, we're really trying across industry to, to get together um, to harmonize best practice for calculations of these exposure limits and then share that knowledge across the community because it does take a lot of time and effort to calculate these PDEs. So, you know, if we can share that and you can use a PDE that's already been calculated, this is going to save us a lot of time and, a lot of time and, and effort. Okay. We're getting near the end now. Um, this is like kind of my last slide. So, you know, as the impurities offer no benefit to the patient, as pharmaceutical companies, we are responsible for controlling these to as lower levels as we possibly can. And the ICH M7 addendum provides really nice guidance and examples of how you can calculate acceptable intakes and permissible daily exposures for our class one mutagenic carcinogens. I've said it a number of times, it's so important to review the scientific literature and the carcinogenic studies rigorously to understand your dose response, um, the tumours that you're seeing, how relevant they are to humans, and make sure you, you know, select an appropriate cancer potency value. And once you've selected your potency value, you, know, you need to also ju justify that, document it, and, and also think about those adjustment factors and why you're selecting the values you are. There are other factors that you need to look at and um, that you consider that might help you in your risk assessment. Um, the endogenous exposure, regulatory exposure limits. There's a lot of information out there that can help you in your assessment. Um, and really, it's just uh, you know, a plea to encourage you know, within your company, with your toxicologist, but also between companies to collaborate and really kind of improve the best practice and improve efficiency in calculating these exposure limits. So this is my last slide. I just wanted to acknowledge the impurity safety team that uh, works with me um, at AstraZeneca, so Liz, Brad, and, and Andy, um, and also to acknowledge the other presenters at that workshop, that PD workshop, because I stole some of their slides for the presentation today. My email is on there. Um, you know, please uh, contact me. I'll be happy to answer kind of any questions either here or, or later down the line if you find yourself in the situation where you have to calculate one of these exposure limits and, uh, and you have any questions. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the informative presentation. 유익한 강연해 주신 연사님께 박수 부탁드립니다.